Well, thanks to all the speakers to, to sticking to time. That gives us about 20 minutes for, for discussion. And uh, allow me to, to uh, what have we, we, we tried to hear, and I think we got a lot of, of, of good ideas and things that work well, and sometimes clearly and sometimes in between the lines, you also, we also heard things that, that sort of need, that are points for further attention and further development. I mean, very, very briefly, I think for the ICH success was really a well-defined process, good management, focal on technical requirements, and focus on implementation. And Pandra, uh, James told us, well, there are some, some good examples of the GLC and the pharmacovigilance, some good guidelines widely accepted by many of the member states. APEC said it was more a loose coalition that was a voluntary thing to start with uh, and was really not developing new standards but promoting existing standards. But there they also said, well, we are now moving towards not so much the ad hoc, let me say, popping up of ideas and standards, but more systematic planning of harmonization projects. And also mentioned the good, the good point of having an APEC harmonization secretariat to, to help with, with developments. And EAC, uh, you saw there's a more recent development, but also there, uh, what Margaret was saying, uh, uh, you need a, a secretariat to really do that, and then you can achieve a lot. So that's the good news. But now let's now look a little bit, and that's where I would like to focus the, the discussion that we may want to have now, a little bit on, the, on, on, on other issues. And I group them in, in three groups. The first one is a little bit about implementation. I mean, uh, where, where is now the actual implementation? Or is it only guidelines on paper? I think some, some of us get, sort of mentioned, oh, we have now a, a lot of good guidelines, but we, we, uh, like uh, uh, James was saying, well, we don't even know how to measure the impact. And, and are, we, are we actually impacting uh, and, and changing behavior now? And of course, that, that comes on the point where uh, countries will have to, to give in or to, to, to let go some of their national sovereignty on these issues. So that's on implementation. Are we actually implementing? The second one, a little bit about governance. I mean, and, and we saw also there, so uh, Margaret didn't say so, I think, but I know that when you have eight economic blocks in Africa, some of the blocks are overlapping. So what do you do with a country that's a member of two blocks? And which of the standards is it going to follow? So that is an issue we, we should, we should uh, know. Um, uh, I'm not sure with whether, but I think uh, from James that I think in, in Latin America you, you may have the same thing. Uh, but the other blocks, APEC and PAHO, they were also talking about, okay, we are now weak, really working towards combining the blocks. That was the issue there. Uh, James was said it, combining the blocks into a sort of pan-continental thing. Um, uh, APEC was also trying to say the same thing. So that is, and that of course calls for the question of how to deal with these different regional standards. You have one block with a regional standard, and you have another block with a regional standard, now you're going to combine it. So that is a sort of, I would say, a higher level harmonization. Uh, the first one is a small sort of few countries together, they harmonize, and then you get groups like that. And how, how do you go higher up in the end? Of course, hopefully, hopefully, uh, before we all die or retire, you may have a, a real global standard that everybody is, is looking at the same thing. So that's this governance issue. How do you combine the blocks now? And then the third one, that was not brought up, but that's a little bit what I would like to mention, is uh, the, the, the scope of, this, uh, of, of the harmonization. Is it actually for the new drugs? Is it bringing to market new drugs, which is a problem, uh, well, a, a real issue, we, we all know that, or is it also focusing on generics? When you think about uh, Africa, but other countries, they are, they are largely generic markets, and when you think about strengthening re regulatory agencies, you probably start by harmonizing your generic evaluations. Uh, also, when you think about uh, capacity building in regulators, uh, regulators groups, you start with, with, with the work on the generics issues. So that measure of content, probably if you start, you move generics, and in the long run, you, when it gets more and more complicated, you go for the, for the uh, let me say, joint or standardized review of the new applications. So three issues, the implementation, the governance issue, and the content issue. Now, may I now invite any comments or questions from the audience specifically, and then we try to have the, the, the panel respond. Could I lead off? Yes, please, please go ahead, please. Please identify yourself. I'm Peter Hutt, a former FDA chief counsel and a regulatory lawyer. Implementation is in significant part dependent upon the legal structure that is involved. And I'd like to lay out uh, an analysis and see how the panel reacts to it. There are basically three levels of legal structure. The top level is mandatory. It's statutory or, in most countries, 
regulatory. And we've heard examples of that. The EU regulations are mandatory. They're not voluntary. The FDA statute that they're now faced with of requiring data standard within five years is mandatory. And you can also have mandatory requirements across countries by having bilateral agreements and treaties. So that is what we should all strive for if we want harmonization, real harmonization. An intermediate level is guidance. Guidance is not mandatory. All the uh, ICU uh, uh, guidance are labeled that they are not binding on either the industry or the governments. Now, the good news about that is the industry takes them so seriously that they come almost to the point of being mandatory. The lowest level is what we've heard a lot of, and that is countries getting together, regions getting together with voluntary convergence. The frustrating part about that is twofold. First of all, it takes forever. And second, once you get there, there's no guarantee as you just pointed out, sir, that one region is going to agree with another. And therefore, you're left with having to work your way up to the chain, to guidance, and then to a mandatory requirement. So I'd like to hear what the panel has to say. Thank you. We'll collect a Thank you very much. It's very enlightening. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, collect a few comments, and then we'll uh, refer to the panel. Yes, sir, please. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Andy Sturgaches, University of Washington. Uh, we heard some examples of the uh, speakers talking about strengthening pharmacovigilance and uh, safety surveillance during the post-marketing stage, but uh, didn't hear anything about activities going on either in APAC or AMRA, and I wondered if the two speakers might address that. Thank you. Thank you. So pharmacovigilance. Yes, please, uh, Michelle. Please identify yourself for those who don't know you. Michelle Forsley, Georgetown O'Neill Institute. My question to the panelists is, have any of you actually uh, interfaced with the trade community, the United States trade representative or the trade reps from other countries, given that so much of the process that you describe is intimately connected with trade agreements? This would be a legal issue as well as the other gentlemen talked about. Thank you. So we have three questions, and I invite any of the panel to take, tackle any of them. So we had a question about the legal, legal structure, uh, mandatory guidance and, and convergence. The question about is there any harmonization of pharmacovigilance? And the third question, uh, what is the link with international trade agreements, bilateral or multilateral? Who would like to start? Yes, please. Uh, as to the, uh, the level of uh, harmonization, the legal and guidance and voluntary, uh, as far as ICH guidelines are, uh, uh, I mean, concerned, these are guidelines, and uh, we implement the uh, regulatory authorities issue the guidelines based upon ICH guidelines. Therefore, they are guidelines; they are not binding. And if you have a good uh, scientific uh, uh, reason or basis, you do not have to uh, comply with the guideline because it is guideline. Therefore, the implementation or issuance of uh, domestic guideline based upon the ICH guideline. For us, it's a, a, the translation from English into Japanese and uh, the issue as the guideline. It is easier to implement for the regulatory authority uh, and uh, it is easier to stick to for the industry. Again, because it is guideline and if you have a basis, you don't have to. And this is, uh, of course, not a treaty. Uh, ICH and other regulatory uh, harmonization uh, initiatives, including uh, GHTF and IMDRF, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's one for cosmetics, they are all voluntary. They are not based on treaty. Therefore, uh, that cannot be uh, at the level of uh, legal mandatory thing. Now, about the voluntary convergence, of course, uh, as uh, regulators, we exchange information. So uh, eventually, some, some convergence or some similarity might occur, but uh, you know, there's no uh, controlling about that. The, uh, uh, regarding the last question about trade, uh, trade the trade thing, uh, ICH as the organization, as far as I know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong about the ICH participants, uh, I don't think ICH has ever contacted 
uh, trade community or trade association for uh, uh, I was involved in the uh, drug regulation and uh, my p re uh, responsibility, was, responsibility was partly with the trading uh, and the negotiation with the uh, US uh, uh, Department of Commerce and everything. But that's different, totally different from my thing. Thank you. Thank you. James, uh, how binding is uh, the Pandra guideline machinery? Uh, and, yeah, thanks, Hans. I was actually going to, I would actually su suggest in terms of classification simpler. It's either mandatory or not. No. Um, uh, and if it's not mandatory, then what is the pathway to ensuring that countries adopt? Uh, and so it can be, as you suggest, uh, uh, through really working with the countries to adopt the guidance, or it can be through more kind of formal processes or convergence. I think, you know, there's many ways to, many ways to skin a cat, you know? So I think we can get there and um, through different routes. But I think the, the in terms of strict mandatory, non-mandatory, I, I would just kind of possibly leave that classification um, there. We've seen, for example, in some countries in the Americas that it can take years, absolutely years. And I'm thinking, I won't mention the countries, but in Mercosur, the negotiations that have, on, that have been ongoing over a specific language within specific regulations that is eventually have a moved. So there have been other mechanisms. I think the voluntary mechanisms provides an alternative route where they begin to work outside, uh, leaving perhaps the lawyers um, to, to continue negotiations, but where the regulators come together and agree on, on basic principles and move forward in implementation. So that's, I think, the, dis the discussion between mandatory and convergence. The other issue is that we have, um, we have seen in Central America, for example, quite a particular context where the harmonization initiatives are being led by the what they call the Union Aduanera, which is the customs agreement of, of um, so regulatory harmonization within the pharmaceutical sector is not being negotiated within health, it's being negotiated by the ministries of economy. And so we have actually struggled uh, and they have struggled as countries to really reposition the discussions of regulatory harmonization within the health sector given that um, the driving force for regulatory harmonization in Central America is the Department <coughs> of the, or the Ministries of Economy. So we are now engaging with, with them, but through the Ministries of Health, because our mandate as WHO is to work principally with the health sector. Thank you very much. Mark, uh, can you take on from here? I mean, the uh, relation with, with trade, uh, trade relations and trade agreements. Definitely. Uh, APEC is all about trade, so it begins there. And uh, that was part of the problem. Um, when it was trade officials that were more or less uh, helpfully directing regulators as to what they should be doing. Um, but in fact, uh, we found it was what happened there is the regulators just pulled out of the exercise and really uh, regulators, I think, and trade officials often can have the same objectives, um, but I think uh, it's proven uh, more helpful uh, to have regulators and the regulated industry and academia kind of leading this, working closely uh, with uh, and reporting up through, for example, uh, we, uh, our decision-making body is the Committee on Trade and Investment within APEC. So we're intimately tied in, uh, but we're doing our thing and that's benefiting, uh, I think, uh, trade uh, in the long run. So uh, clearly a relation under APEC. Uh, pharmacovigilance, just quickly, we do have a roadmap that's under development. We discussed that two weeks ago in Jakarta. Uh, it still needs some work, but we will be having a workshop, an international workshop on that because it is an extremely important and increasingly important area, post-market surveillance and pharmacovigilance. We're also tying that roadmap into other roadmaps such as biotech with risk management plans, same thing with cellular therapies and good review practices. So that is uh, definitely one of our priorities and um, I think what we need to do is say where would we add value to many of the activities that are taking place internationally and what is right for the APEC uh, region in terms of pharmacovigilance. On the first question, that's uh, very interesting observations. I would say a number of things. Um, if uh, regulatory convergence takes forever, well, then uh, having harmonized mandatory uh, regulations globally would take forever plus. Uh, okay, and I would also say that there's just so much that regulators can do. We operate within our sp uh, sphere, but now we're talking about different drivers. Now we're talking about uh, political leaders, economic drivers, 
and single markets, which is taking place in ASEAN, which is taking place, of course, it has taken place in the EU and may take place uh, in other regions. What I'm saying is that you don't have to wait for that. And even if you have those mandatory uh, harmonized regulations, it's not sufficient. What does it mean if it's on paper, but it isn't executed in reality? So I would challenge, I think, a little bit of those uh, statements, and I agree entirely with James that it's mandatory or not, and same thing for international arrangements. They're treaties or they're not. You know, you can call it MOU, uh, you can call it a statement of cooperation, either it's mandatory or it's not. And I think there's a lot that we can do and we've seen in the APEC region in a very short period of time uh, because people are interested, realize there's a problem, for example, with multi-regional clinical trials, with supply chain integrity. And we're, I think, uh, uh, leading the way with regulators and industry that are committed Thank to you. making that change. Thank you very much. Mike, can I ask Margaret to say something about pharmacovigilance? I mean, we should realize that for some medicines, <laughs> This, this, uh, the only way where we can get uh, real safety data is, is from Africa when we talk about uh, uh, pediatric AIDS and other medicines. So go there and afterwards feel free <laughs> Actually, to go anywhere else. Actually, I would else. prefer to explain about the process that we're yes. undertaking, whether it's um, you know, like administrative or mandatory based on the question that was, um, was raised, actually, go ahead. Uh, instead of talking about pharmacovigilance, because I think that is rather too high for us. So in terms of the approach we're taking for regulatory harmonization, and especially in East African community, um, uh, this is the based on the agreement with partners, including WHO, we are saying it's, it should be a stepwise method, whereby we're starting with countries agreeing on the guidelines, you know, requirements, and then that in itself, once it's done and you're able to get to a next stage of having them to work together through a joint assessment and joint inspection, then you kind of build trust in the process. And by doing that, of course, the, the, the anticipation is that at some point they should be able to use the, um, the assessment reports as basis for making their own national regulatory decisions. But of course, slowly we are looking into getting into some kind of mutual agreements between countries, but also centralized procedure, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation. So it's a stepwise approach. And uh, it will take time, but I think the, the most important thing is to really go slowly, step by step. Of course, the challenge we, we have is also that you have um, the, um, the treaty that establishes, for example, the East African community. That in itself, uh, when it comes to member states um, conforming to the treaty agreement, it's not really binding because it's more persuasive. There's no sanction that you can impose on a country that does not you know, comply to some of the um, uh, um, agreed um, sort of um, provisions. And therefore, we're looking into the possibility at a later stage to really have some legal instruments that will facilitate the process. That's what I can say on that. All right, so that brings us back to what also Mike said about APEC, that you have to be clear what you expect, what, what are your goals now, what, what are you trying to do and, and, and why, and, and probably be realistic also in, in what you can achieve in, in what, what time frame. Now, it's half past 12 now. Uh, I think it's fascinating, but I also know it's, it's, it's time for lunch. Can, can we allow, would you agree to, that we allow for one more question and then get, uh, so that we just enjoy and, and, and make use of the fact that we have such high-level experts here? Is there any more question we'd like to put to them or observation? If not... No, I don't think so. If not, then I think we should give you all for a hand. And thank you very much for a very interesting one. <laughs> We've got uh, Tracy, who's going to give us an announcement about logistics for lunch. Yeah, um, lunch is outside. Uh, you can feel free to bring it in the room here. There are a few tables out in the Great Hall, or just find some space. Um, Steve's going to talk later, but in, in the afternoon, I think most of you know, we're going to be doing concurrent breakout sessions. If you were not able to let us know in advance where you wanted to go, we can give you the information for whichever group you want to join. And we have maps of the building, if that's helpful to anyone. And before we break, I really wanted to take an opportunity that I should have done at the beginning to thank Tracy, who's been uh, the staff lead at IOM, putting this all together, and her colleagues, Robin Geis and Liz Tyson. It's, it's uh, as you can tell, going really well.